I'll start the All right. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Henry Danielson. Uh, hopefully, I'll do the shakes and make sure you can you can still see my screen. Brenda, can you confirm that? I like to call it the shakes. Yes, I can okay. see it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, I, I have a few roles and I'll just tell you, no ego attached, but just very excited to be here. And thanks to Mark and everyone uh, on the team for allowing me to be here. I'm honored. Uh, I'm a Cal Poly professor uh, in San Luis Obispo, California. I've uh, been there for 19 years. Uh, I teach multiple uh, subjects, some uh, stuff on cybersecurity, space, uh, and a couple other things uh, in, in the hopper. Um, I'm a CISO and a cyberspace researcher. Um, I also work for the Aerospace Village at DEF CON. And I was just explaining to Brenda what DEF CON is. DEF CON is the largest hacking convention on the planet that happens in Las Vegas. Has about 40,000 people uh, annually, depending on you know who can come and who can't because they're from international places. And I am what's called a goon at DEF CON. So I'm one of the staff members uh, or one of the hackers that helps put that event on and makes it be what it is. So if you've never been to DEF CON, Google it. Uh, super fun. There's even a little movie about DEF CON as well as uh, Badge Life. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. My email, please connect with me at hdaniels at calpoly.edu. Um, and again, uh, ethics are paramount with this. Uh, and again, uh, I just want to show you some other quick pictures. I'm going to show a few cool things today. Um, having to do with badges, having to do with satellites. I want to give some little bit of background. Uh, before I do that, though, the disclaimer, these activities and ideas are for education purposes and ethical purposes only. Participants will not use for any purposes unlawful that is prohibited. No content replication of any kind is allowed without express written permission. They'll just contact me. I can give you the slides, do whatever you need to do. I am an educator. Uh, I also um, work at a, a military base uh, doing cybersecurity um, for the government. I work uh, with Space Force as well as the Air Force Research Lab and some other folks out there. Uh, but first, to open my sesh, if you will, I want to talk a little bit about something I'm very passionate about. It's called the Space Grand Challenge. And this is gamification and esports for space and cybersecurity's development. And this is a, a program we've been doing for five years uh, with middle and high school students. And I'll say that again, blown away that uh, there's middle and high school kids that learn how uh, to protect satellites. Uh, and we go all the way down to the, the CIA triad, which has to do with um, uh, the beginnings of cybersecurity all the way up to space and understanding orbital mechanics or orbital uh, dynamics. And I teach the students this so that we can try to get them into um, to space, uh, try to get them to protect our assets, if you will. And I'm going to show a little bit about that. So the Space Grand Challenge, we just ran it in October. Uh, again, it was for anybody. Uh, we ran it for a week. Um, and I'm going to show you kind of what it looks like really quick. Uh, but again, this is my big plug, just like Mark showing kind of what some cool things are uh, is out there. But again, um, what's really amazing about it is I've prepared a 80 hour course curriculum for young people on the introduction to uh, Deep Space uh, Network with my friend, Laura Chapel. Uh, we also envelop uh, the NICE framework, ethics and cybersecurity. Um, and then we talk a lot about uh, how assets can be protected. We talk about things like jamming and spoofing that we'll get into a little bit later. And again, and I work at the California Cybersecurity Institute, which allows me to help young people get into this space. Um, and I wanted to show you what it looks like. So this is the game itself. Um, and let me back up a little bit so you can see. Um, and let me just refresh the page here. Just a second, sorry. Put us right there. Uh, and this is a free game that you can play. Uh, this is our technology pre-qualification challenge. I'm going to put this in there. That's for anybody for free. There are five challenges in here having to do with Caesar ciphers all the way up to different ones. Um, and again, I just wanted to kind of show you what it looks like uh, to give you the first challenge as you walk through here uh, on the ground. Uh, you can see 9184 is on the ground as you walk up to this uh, and touch it. You can press E and I'll do 9184 and enter and then I can continue on and I quit out of this. And now as I walk up to this, I can actually get into the module and the door will open and I will be able to go into pod one. I'm excited 
Uh, one of the answers that might be up on the top, satellites are used for collecting data uh, about our planet. So again, a really cool thing that I have uh, prepared out there and I'm really stoked to be able to share a little bit about that. And then last but not least, uh, we have a space cybernet um, website. Sorry, I didn't pull that up um, that I wanna show you. Uh, another one that is gamified and allows students um, to understand about a satellite challenge. And this is the badge that we created that has lights and on the back of it, um, the challenges um, are right here. And uh, there's a bunch of different challenges available uh, for young people, again, middle and high school students, or I also like to say students that have never touched uh, anything to do with that. All right, so let's power on power puffs. So the beginning of space flight, I'm just gonna zip through here. I'd love to hear uh, this. This is the sound of Sputnik just to get you excited. That is it communicating with the USSR uh, in 1957. So now you've heard what satellite uh, tones and what they actually sound like. Um, that was launched in um, uh, October 4th, 1957. Um, and then they followed up with that one um, on November 3rd, a little bit longer, including a heavier payload and of course the dog Leica. Um, and the dog Leica board lifted off with G-forces reaching five times normal gravity. And at that time in the, in the 50s, this was a monumental thing that just changed people's lives. And again, I'm just giving you a quick background as I'm zipping through. Uh, then of course, the United States, we were getting involved as well. 1958, that's when NASA was born, hence my shirt. Very, very big fan of them trying to explore all the planets out there. Um, we also had cosmic ray detectors, meteorologic dust detectors. Uh, the mission end date was May 23rd. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit uh, right now about Pergi and Apogee. Uh, and I want you to kind of have a little bit of understanding of space and some people in the in the space domain right here with me. Uh, I know Sharon, who's in a spacesuit. Uh, uh, it will will just uh, have to deal with my my quick nomenclature of teaching what that is. But basically, um, what happens is if you have Earth right here, the satellite at the perigee, and then the satellite apogee, and it's the distance between the satellite and Earth is very high or far away, it's called the apogee. Um, and then down here, uh, you have what's called the perigee, which is the nearest point. So you can see this is the nearest point to Earth with the satellite rotating, and this one is there. And I didn't wanna get into too much detail about that, but I did wanna make sure you kinda understand as we start to go through this, um, some technical terms of what, what that kinda means. And this is really cool. This is a part of, what we call the spacecraft uh, Mariner. Um, and this was on 73. This one was uh, amazing because the, the Venus Mercury, uh, call, also called the Mariner 10, I believe, uh, was launched from Kennedy. And it was the first spacecraft designed to use gravity to assist. Uh, three months after its launch, it flew by Venus, changed speed and trajectory, then crossed Mercury's orbit in March of 1974. And then this photo kind of identifies uh, this great spacecraft has a lot of cool things on here. And at that time, these were science changers, uh, things that we needed to have to be able to talk uh, back to earth, as well as to be able to deliver some great science and information. Uh, and you can see from sunshades, uh, antennas that are uh, doing point to point to talk to the earth, uh, to the ground station, just a really cool, cool thing and excitement. So then um, spacecraft or SC, sometimes they call them in mission types. Um, we have Earth orbiters and they do a couple things. Uh, communication, uh, they do remote sensing for weather to make sure uh, we can actually watch when hazardous uh, weather come to different parts of the, um, the Earth. Uh, navigation, we also use it for astronomy um, and then also military. And the Earth orbiters are international, domestic, direct broadcast, and then of course the military has their private ones that they use uh, as well for wartime and war fighting. Uh, and then planetary and lunar orbits are flyby probes. Uh, and then of course um, robotics is really, really high right now, um, as well as um, 3D printing. Like for example, they have one on the on, on ISS, and they do wonderful things to fix things. Um, and again, surveillance uh, in these lunar explorers early warning uh, detection. 
Um, so I just wanted to give you kind of a little bit of a base knowledge. We're almost to the, the fun parts. Um, this one, where are the objects? I think this always blows me away. Um, countries uh, that have kind of like what's called the satellite box store, um, uh, box score. And this is as of July 23, cataloged by the United Space Space Surveillance Network. Um, and you can see the spacecraft that have uh, a lot um, and how many uh, are flying about, if you will. So I just find this fascinating. I think it's really critical um, information to front load with any student or anyone that I'm talking to about this because I think it's really remarkable that it's available out there. Okay, so let's take a look at what's out there right now. And I'm gonna go into our low earth orbit and let me refresh all this. Um, this is a great thing and I'll put this in here. Um, please share this. Um, go tonight to dinner, I'll pop this on your phone uh, and show someone and educate them about what's actually going on in low earth orbit. These are the amount of um, spacecraft that are going. A lot of them uh, have to do with um, uh, uh, satellites that are giving internet like Starlink. Also, some are out there, uh, the CubeSats that have been a huge um, thing that, that have shown for a while. Uh, and I can take the beams off. Um, and let me do the auto refresh, keep that off there. Um, but you can see the amount uh, of different things that are actually uh, happening uh, while <laughs> we're just sitting down here on Earth. Uh, kind of shows you um, the debris. Um, and after about two minutes, it changes to a different view uh, and kind of gives you a little bit better. And then of course you can click through and take some of the instruments off um, to actually show some different things. So um, really cool um, country of origin you can choose. Um, so if we went into our, well, just pop in Canada there and add the filter. Now we're looking at Canada's view and you can see some of the current satellites uh, that are zipping around uh, our wonderful planet. So this is one thing that I think is really amazing and I wanted to share that with you. Another component about this uh, that I wanna talk a little bit about, thank you, Brenda, um, uh, is spacetracker.org. Uh, this is, you do have to join, but this is part of something that I feel is amazing and teaches people, but look up, um, anything, any kind of, they call it a catalog or a cat ID, um, but this shows, and you can see within the picture I took, it shows Sputnik 1, 2, talks about all the different types, what country it's from, when it launched. These are really critical things to teach young people about, and what I do in some of my uh, games is I pick five different items and I have them go find that information. And just to give you an idea what it looks like, spacetrack.org, uh, this is what it looks like. And sorry, let me log in. I thought I was logged in. Here we go. Um, but you can mani manipulate this. And again, you do have to have a, a um, uh, account to be able to do this, uh, but you can go over to the SatCat. That's what I did. Um, and you can check the TLE, which um, we'll talk a little bit about later. There's no results. Turn, return. Sorry about that. Um, let's go about this one. Um, so this gives you specific information about uh, the satellite. And again, um, I go through detail with the students on how to use spacetracker.org. But I wanted uh, noobs out there that don't know a lot about satellites about that. All right, now we're going to get into some cool stuff. This is satellite um, foundational understanding of how protecting satellites and how they can be compromised and why this is important. So first, one of the things that we haven't done in the past, and we've got uh, to continue to do this now, and we do, um, to give you an idea, like Aerospace Corp now has uh, whenever they design a satellite for the government or help them, they use what's called secure by design. And that's when you're putting cybersecurity at the design phase of the system um, and processes so they're foundationally secure. What we've been trying to do is the after effect, where uh, there's been some analog pieces of spacecraft up there for many, many years, and trying to protect them is very hard because it wasn't thought through at the early stages. Now, at the early stages of this, nobody was hacking satellites. Um, it was pretty rare. Um, and this little page from 
or graphic from the space ISAC kind of talks and gives you a high level of space cyber threats and actually what goes on. But here is where that threat actor uh, or industrial control actor uh, could get into the ground station. Sometimes they use social engineering. Sometimes they use networks uh, to be able to get in to penetrate. Kind of depends on what their common goal is and what they're trying to do. But this is a great thing from the Defense uh, Intelligence Agency just to kind of give you a visual of what actually what happens. And the ground station talks to the satellite. Then you have a cross link that has other uh, areas that that talk about the space-based um, internal external attack. And a lot of times uh, that could be jamming or spoofing and we'll get, um, please switch to the power pool. Okay, I can do that. There you go, sir. Um, thanks, Juniette. Um, so when designing a spacecraft and the payload, there are many challenges, much more that can be described in the graphic. But I just wanted to kind of show you the challenges that we have uh, currently. And you have to design a satellite to work for 10 years. This is a huge uh, problem because you have to know that this is going to be remote controlled, right? From thousands, from 36,000s or more kilometers away. And you have to understand how batteries work in space, uh, what the fuel is, the weather, contamination. Um, how do you critically fix something? Uh, some of these devices are, sorry, space spacecraft are flying 10,000 miles per hour around. Uh, and you can't just, you know, try to catch it and, and fix it. Um, so some of the solutions are extensive planning, uh, redundancy of components. So a lot of times you'll have two or three pieces of redundant hardware on the spacecraft to make sure if one follows through, uh, the other one uh, will will not be able to, um, you know, have a problem. Fail safe modes, um, and you have to do extensive testing before the launch happens. Um, and a lot of times they're doing something nowadays called a digital twin. Uh, where it's basically a sandbox that reproduces the exact code, hardware, everything, so that they can actually test it. Um, and this is from the Aerospace Corp. So I'm going to get a little technical in here, and I'll, I'll go quick with this. Um, but commands are instructions that are sent to the spacecraft. And I'm giving you this background knowledge so you'll be able to understand in a minute how hacking happens and what they kind of do. Um, and... They're sent to the spacecraft and the database translates text-based commands and parameters to the binary form required by the spacecraft and that instrument or the payload, which is usually doing the science or doing something on the spacecraft. Telemetry is, or the TLM is data from the spacecraft, it's telemetry, engineering, housekeeping, or science data. It uses that. The command controls or C2, we like to call it, is the workstation that relays those commands from end to end from spacecraft in a reliable manner. A manner. And then the front end processor encodes it and sends commands to the spacecraft to receive and decode it, uh, the telemetry from the spacecraft. Cryptography has always been there, but not um, uh, different places. And there's uh, keep, is do they self destruction to dust mode? Um, kind of. Is there any networking uh, across different satellites? Yes, there's a few deep space networks out there. Um, as well as low Earth orbit ones, which uh, communicate um, in the UHF band. So cryptography is really important because it encrypts the data uh, before the modem. Not all space systems have this encryption, but they are using that now. Um, and the modem, again, uh, uses that data depending on the direction. So I wanted to give you those things so you could see a, vi a, a visually picture. So the command control is on the left-hand side right here. Uh, then it goes and the telemetry uh, cruises back and forth. This is where the modem hits. And then the, the satellite communicates uh, through here, the TLM, as well as the command. So again, a little technical, and I won't go through this one because it's too, too deep. But there are many functions with spacecraft depending on their payloads and their missions. So a lot of times, um, communications, uh, applications, and we'll call them special uh, zones. And so the civil communications usually... Uh, also, military, strategic, military, tactical, relay, and direct. Uh, Earth-looking sensing uh, has to do with their weather, early warnings, nuclear bursts, oceanography. Um, and then scientific is amazing because we're learning and changing our scientific applications all the time. Of course, we've been human exploration uh, for many, many years. International Space Station collaborates with many uh, places out there. There are deep space probes out there. 
Um, and then the other ones are manufacturing in space. So the ISS, like I said, has a 3D printer on it, does some amazing things to try to fix things if it can. Um, and then special is intelligence, uh, reconnaissance jamming. Um, we'll talk a little bit about those. And of course, theoretical weapons that happen. So satellite hacking, we'll talk a little bit about that really quick here. And again, this is more of um, securing them as having a huge traction across the globe. Part of that is, um, it's not that uh, expensive to do, and satellites are used to keep our world's communications critical infrastructure and operational. Hack hackers, uh, a lot of times, will use tactical um, information to compromise satellites as their comms or communication. And one of the biggest ones out there is called jamming or spoofing and speeding up the thrusters, maybe to change directions, possibly crash them into sat other satellites. If you crash them into other satellites, it usually wipes out uh, a lot of them because they're going for, uh, you know, a, a little hole the size of a silver dollar could turn into something massive that could create uh, major damage. So to give you an example, an attacker could access the, his the systems on the Hubble telescope, open its camera hatch while pointed at the sun, destroying those sensitive object uh, optical uh, parts. They could also use the solar panels to blow out the batteries. So many satellites are so uh, they're vulnerable to jamming attacks that could disrupt important commands uh, from the ground control. Good thing is um, NASA and other folks in the military are finding ways to uh, block these signals. And uh, and again, uh, if they were to take control of these satellites, um, but again, we also have redundancy. There's many satellites that run our GPS. It's not just one. So if we did have problems with that, um, it, it would be a little bit... Uh, hectic. And hackers could also, again, jam or spoof the signals from satellites creating havoc for critical infrastructure. So here's just a kind of an uplink jamming. Um, they use a specific device to be able to uh, block the uplink from going from uh, the ground to the satellite. Uh, and then the downlink also comes back where that's the data from the satellite traveling uh, in space back down and gets intercepted and the downlink could be jammed. Um, the vulnerabilities um, are highlighted in gray and black. So these are just a great um, attack vector, they call them, in orbit to show the need for IoT and satellite security. Uh, at one point, uh, JPL had been compromised, um, and you can look that up, uh, because of an IoT device. Um, and sometimes those things happen because we're not protecting anything and everything that we use uh, when we go up to space. Um, so this is just a kind of a visual to kind of show you. It's very similar to the other one, but just a little bit better of a visual. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the unintentional threats to satellites. Um, the type of threats are on the left. Those are the ground base, which are natural occurrences, which of course include like earthquakes and floods, the ground stations, um, uh, talk about our, uh, tactics threats, um, and our data links. And then the space-based space environment, solar, cosmic radiation, temperature variations, um, and that makes our satellites and data links pretty, pretty scary. The telemetry tracking command, um, again, um, are, are sacred because those make everything a little bit more vulnerable. And then the last, the interference oriented is a social, or sorry, solar activity, which is atmospheric and solar disturbances. And one more quick one I wanted to show you uh, about this is phase one uh, up here on the right is an infected system called the decoy satellite. Um, so this is the office. And what it ends up doing is phase two, after they, they get into the ground station system, that would be a hacker, then the satellite broadcasts a call over the whole coverage area. Because this computer right here does command control, it actually can change and do different things to uh, physically the satellite. Um, that comes back down here to um, phase three, which is the decoy system drops an invalid request, having no such port or service. So they're trying to get in, but they don't realize that um, there's nothing there. So the hacker has to pivot and then pretending to be a decoy using accepts the call. Um, and after that, phase five, the malware is infected on the system um, and the command control is then at some point uh, masquerading and becomes a decoy system. And I know that was fast and furious, but again, if you have more questions, I can show you later. Um, 
understanding again the space through a cybersecurity lens. Um, the this is a great course. It's available. Um, totally awesome by my friend Jerry. I just wanted to share that with you. Anytime I find cool stuff on the webs doing this, I try to share it with the young people and have them watch specific parts of this. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about Hackasat. So uh, currently in the past uh, four years, um, the Air Force and their Air Force Research Lab created something out there called the Hackasat. And they had it at DEF CON, which I talked a little bit about, which is the largest hacking convention in the planet. And they had a huge Costco sized room where um, five teams would end up coming to Las Vegas to compete live and do live hacking on a satellite. And the satellite this year um, uh, was amazing. It was called Moonlighter. And that's this picture right here. Um, and what they were able to do was get in. There's a large camera on here. They could turn on the camera. They could disable the camera. Uh, they could point it in different directions to take specific ones. They could get onto the payload, which has the code that tells the satellite what to do, uh, different things to that effect. Um, and I just think it's a, a really cool one. And I wanted to watch this really quick vid. And let me find him. Rachel, sorry about that. Oops. Beep. All right. And I love using video videos. Be Welcome before back to Tiny Mike Interviews at DEF CON 31. Today we have Rachel here. Uh, and we're at the Hackasat contest -like yes. area. Yep. So tell me about this project. Because you were telling me before that this has been happening I've been in the works for four years. Exactly. Yep. So a little bit of history. We have been at DEF CON with the Aerospace Village. We're kind of in conjunction this year and happy to be here with them. Um, so in years past, we have run a CTF, a qualification event, and a finals event. However, what's exciting this year is not only are we live in person for our CTF finals, we have our teams in front of us. We also have an orbiting satellite for Hackasat 4. And so that has been the biggest change from year one to four. We've been in a, a four-year iteration of design, build, break, and we are finally breaking because we have a satellite to hack out there on orbit, and that's really, really exciting for us. So this is the actual satellite that's in orbit. This is the model of the, the model. actual satellite, yes. Yep, so Moonlighter, as we call it, is a 3U CubeSat. It is out in LEO orbiting in space. Our teams are communicating that through our game ops and satellite ops behind me. Um, and this is quite literally how it looks, how it's designed, the camera on top, the wings on the side for the solar panels. This is quite literally as real as it gets. So why are they actually hacking? What's the end goal of this CTF, of this competition? Sure. Yeah, so these teams, the five teams that are here with us today, they competed in quals, they placed in the top five. They came here today to quite literally have the ability to contact the satellite, send commands up, receive commands back down, and that's ultimately how they're being scored. We do have some ground station challenges, but for the most part, this is a space CTF, the first of its kind, and so they are sending things up to the satellite, waiting for their information to come back down and see how it goes. Um, things like taking pictures with the satellite, um, you know, anything orbital mechanics, you name it, we tried to involve it, include it, and the team's so far so good. I mean, that sounds so cool. So they are actually hacking on a live satellite right now that's in space, yes. in low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit. So we um, we were launched in June out of Florida on the SpaceX 28 mission. Where that was an ISS resupply. In July, we have a nice video we shot out of the ISS as it was out in space to get into our own orbit. So the bird went off. Um, we were able to get live footage of that. And so we've been up in space now about a month on our own. Things are going really well, knock on wood. Um, and so, yeah, so the teams, the communicating with that satellite, a lot of the visuals in here and what the teams are really focused on are contact windows. So we have times that we're on contact and then, you know, some, some downtime where they're getting all their calculations and doing all of, all of the smart things that it takes to complete a CTF. Okay, I will stop there. Um, but I wanted to fi finalize, it looks like I'm at time 946, but just tell you, uh, about Hackasat again, an amazing uh, feat, uh, never been done before and letting people play on this and they will bring it back and let other folks learn about uh, Hackasat and how that actually gets done. Uh, to give you an idea, this is one of the challenges they give. They gave you five of these and you had to figure out which viability score it was. Um, and that was one of the challenges they've done. I also wanted to finalize and leave with the International Space Station. 
Uh, this is an older picture, but still makes me smile and makes me laugh. And my last part is I'm gonna put in the I, uh, IPN SIG. This is um, has to do with the uh, Interplanetary Network uh, special interest group that I work with, with Vince Cerf, uh, JPL, and a bunch of other folks out there. And there's a free library, uh, and I'll put that in the chat as well, that allows you to learn about deep space networks. Um, and we built basically a huge library that's free for anyone, and we've rated it by beginning, uh, beginner to advanced. So uh, that is my presentation. I hope that was down and dirty. Uh, I'm very impressed for all of you for staying in and listening to me. Uh, I'm very honored with everyone else uh, that, that is in this, uh, wonderful world. And thanks again to Mark and all the team and Brenda for hosting. Um, is there any quick questions before we have to drop? Thanks. And you can put them in chat. I'm watching chat. Yeah. There was a couple in the chat that that was fascinating. I have like a million questions. I'll defer to our folks that are here first, but there were a couple way at the beginning of your presentation with respects to the educational links you were saying, and if all the challenges that you were talking about were open to international students. Yes, everything is. That's uh, yes, Steve. Uh, challenges open international. Yes, it's all free. Um, and again, that one that I put in there that is a prequal challenge anybody can do. And we are going to be doing our next one in 2024 of April. Um, and we will have the registration on that. And I can put that in there. Hold on just a second. Let me give you the courses. And again, the course. Um, whoop. And then also, well, you're doing that, Daniel. I just want, or Henry, sorry, I just want to uh, interject. You guys have a good, um, like, twenty-five minutes left, so you got plenty of time. Uh, okay, okay. I thought it was done at forty-five. Okay. Um, go ahead. So I was, I put two in there. Um, is there a list of competitions like uh, on a web page? Um, yeah, there is ctf.org, but it doesn't do space ones. Um. I'm not aware of too many space CTFs that are out there. There are a few, um, but uh, yeah, to answer your questions. Yeah, so we should, we should make one, I agree. <laughs> How does this project support space data industry becoming more aware of cybersecurity? Um, well, one thing is uh, I work with uh, Aerospace Corporation, Space Force and the Air Force Research Labs. And what I do uh, is, uh, I think, no, a year ago, a year and a half ago, we had the actual Space Force Guardians play our Space Grand Challenge uh, to make them aware and test it to see if we were uh, doing what, what we thought was uh, good. And the, the Guardians from Space Force, and these are newer Guardians that were just joining the Space Force, said it was a not, uh, great, and they really appreciated um, the level of teaching that, that I gave and the game that they played because it's gamification. Um, and also within the cybersecurity uh, realm, we use the NICE K-12 uh, model, which has to do with NIST, which is basically a, a huge list of policies on how cybersecurity should be involved. Um, we also work, again, with the Aerospace Corporation, um, and we make badges that we give out to the kids, and we have uh, symposiums and other things like this where we reach out to middle and high school students that are out there. Um, and the industry um, really, really has been very supportive as soon as we show this. And again, this has all been for free. Uh, we put everything on our servers and do it all ourselves. And Cal Poly students design it, not the high school, middle school, school kids, but the college students design it with myself and one other wizard. And then we also have a technical um, advisory board that looks over our challenges to make sure we're not giving too much information out there uh, that would get to our adversaries. So I'm always quite, um, I don't know, secure if I can in, in some ways. How does someone switch his career after 27 years as a web developer? Um, I think that if you if you have network, I would go straight into networking and I would take some of Mark's courses to get the background and understanding of how space works. And once you get into that, I would, I mean, I, I'm pumping myself. I would take my 80 hour course. Um, you can do a deep space network. Um, there's lots of different courses out there on cybersecurity and space. Um, and I would friend um, a guy named Brandon Bailey that works at Aerospace Corp and watch some of his YouTube videos. So um, the one that said that, Rob, I think that's a great thing. And I, I welcome, please email me at hdaniels at calpoly.edu and I can help you point in the right direction. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amal, for the kindness. 
informative presentation. Let me scroll up and see if there's other ones. Um, let's see, is there any other ones I didn't happen to? Has it happened to avoid a compromised satellite when the satellite is a node? How would we do if extraterrestrial does it? So that's a really great point. Uh, extra extraterrestrial, um, we are looking at that. Uh, you know, satellites um, are in our Earth orbit as well as you know the the higher orbits, and I think that's something that we really have to consider. And I'm going to pivot really quick and say cybersecurity can also be a problem with threat actors that claim that they know information about extraterrestrial things. So they may trick you in thinking that something's actually going on um, and you may believe that the extraterrestrial did something to the satellite. They could pivot and make it sound like something from the extraterrestrials done something to our satellites. And so those are, those are the type of vector threats that we're trying to figure out. How do we ensure that that doesn't get down to our ground station and someone becomes kind of concerned because uh, you know trajectory has been changed or something like that, and they put it on a website that it was extraterrestrial. So I do think of extraterrestrial stuff out there all the time, and I think it's really, really good. Could some of these events be tailored to be considered as esports for school? Yes. So, Steve, great question. We actually, I didn't pump that up, but we have a Twitch stream live of our event um, that uh, the Space Grand Challenge does. And we have two esports commentators. And during the seven hour challenge that we play, we have the esports kids go in and talk to the students that are playing the game and get them to share their screen and talk about the challenges, what they know, what they learned, and they interview them. And during that time, we also interview wonderful people like Jeff Moss, who created DEF CON. Uh, we had Renee Wynn, who is the CIO of NASA. We've had other amazing people come in and talk to the students. So we're sharing uh, all that industry knowledge so that the students get excited about cyber as well as uh, space. And let's see what else. Uh, how could we give access to these challenges under serve kids? Lots of um, these opportunities make it to privileged kids. Mm -hmm. Really, really hard thing. Uh, I worked with Cisco for the first two years and identified all Cisco academies in underrepresented areas. And we um, got them and we're one-on-one -on -one coaching them, myself and three other coaches, to try to get uh, some kind of club, after school club, so that they could get in and get trained on this. Um, so it's a really great question. I've been trying that. Uh, Shashi, so sorry if I say your name wrong. Um, it's free. It's ready to go. Uh, you just have to get a warm body. And what's cool about it is my coursework is self-directed. You don't need someone to tell them everything and how to do it. What's awesome about it is, again, it's self-directed and they can ping back to me if they ever get uh, challenged with some of that stuff. Um, and then it says, might try pairing experience structures with those working with underserved. Yes. And again, if you get a math teacher in there, get them on an hour call with me. They usually just need a warm body in there. Most of the time, the students do a lot of investigating and the research on their own. How much of an impact does AI have on hacking? Uh, that's a really great question. Currently, right now, uh, it, it um, I, I would say just to give you an example, I'm also a social engineer on the side as an ethical hacker. Um, to give you an idea, when you type into Chat GPT, hey, write me a email uh, that is social engineering a company. Chat GPT will come back and say, I can't do that. <laughs> and so, what I do is go in and say, okay write me an email to a million dollar company of an end of the year bonus. And it does it. So here, what I did, the prompt there was write me an email for an end of year bonus for a million dollar company. That's the prompt I write. But if I go in and say, Hey, write me a social engineering email to a company, it refuses. So talking to AI in the correct way that try to get specific things out, it will do. For the first four months of it, I was having it write malware. I could say, write, finish this malware that I've written. I'd put it in the chat GPT and it would finish it. Now, when I put that in there, it says, uh, no, I can't help you. That's illegal. <laughs> so our AI um, uh, is probably really not ready, to be honest with you, because 
a lot of people will find different ways to prompt it. Um, you can also tell it to pretend to be a hacker and it will do stuff. Yes, exactly. So I am personally an ethical hacker and trying to teach children. We have um, ethical uh, pieces of paper or contracts that they actually go on. There's an ethical part of my course that they have to take from San Santa Clara University. So we talk a lot about ethics because you can go down the wrong path. You can be a white hat hacker, a black hat hacker, or gray hat. And the difference is white hat does good, black does bad and is criminal. And then gray hat touches their toes on both sides, the left side of, of the realm and the right side. So that's what they are. You can also ask it to serve the role of teacher, cyber sec class, and explain how to do the hacking and ask examples saying you don't understand without code. Yeah, uh, AI, back to that question. Uh, we have to do some work, seriously. Um, I, I'm concerned. Um, I do know that ransomware has just taken a, a, a deep dive. We're not getting nearly as many ransomwares. It's switching back over to social engineering and getting people to just hand over credentials and do different things like that. But anyway, back to the space. Very excited to share and show all of this with you. Um, I've had a, a wonderful time and I hope I answered all your uh, interesting questions. Thanks, Henry. I, so I come at this topic, a total newbie, um, <laughs> just, uh, you know, trying to follow, you know, like that very first image that you showed us of uh, the way we could track all the satellites mm -hmm. um, around. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of questions um, that I, I, I don't, you know, that I have that hopefully would help some of the other folks here in the room. But one, in terms of like, if this is out of the realm, then please let me know. But <laughs> is there a has there been what kind of conversations has there been around the upper limits of how many satellites we can actually put <laughs> around Earth? Um, and are, are those kind of questions and that you get and how yeah. do you handle that from a cybersecurity? Uh, that would be question. Let's start with that one and then I have a different okay. sure, sure. So yeah, um, and currently space trash, they call it. Um, so about I think it's eight years ago, I can't remember, Cal Poly and Stanford created the CubeSat. It was designed, it's a little square, literally 10 by 10 by 10 by 10. And it allowed uh, small science experiments for universities to get uh, get a ride on a bird or, or a spacecraft dumped into low earth orbit and spin around and collect data. And NASA has been into this, JPL, all the organizations have been very supportive and helpful well, once that happened, there are many, many universities doing this. So at one point, uh, their science was collected. It's done. It's still spinning around there, right? So we didn't really do the math to kind of understand, oh, wow, mm. uh, if we give this to everybody and everybody continues to bring it up there. And again, I think if I refresh this page, you can see the amount that is up there. It's out of control. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that that low earth orbit um, allows someone right now, you could probably do it for five to six grand. You could get yourself a CubeSat, get it on someone's satellite or sorry, someone's spacecraft and get up there. Now it's so competitive now. Um, other people are doing crazy things. Like I, I met a guy the other day that had a ship and he was launching from a rocket into into low earth orbit which is not that far up there and then coming back down um just to drop off seven cubesats wow. so other people are private industries are also dumping stuff up up in our space it is being worked on currently nasa has a whole division of it um it is being uh thought out and they're trying to figure out ways to capture some of the debris and some of the space trash to try to bring it back. I've seen two things where they they, they literally have a net. And remember a net, 10,000 miles an hour, got to be pretty strong to catch these suckers mm. without busting through the net. Um, they're trying to figure out different ways to be able to uh, reduce that. So does that help? That gives you kind of a little, little mini basis. It does. And it makes me think again, again, from a, from a, a newbie's perspective, as you're talking about data transmission up and down, um, is any of this data actually stored on these satellites? Uh, yeah. If so, when we're trying mm -hmm. to bring them down, how are we? Yeah, make sure it's not data? compromised. So yeah, yeah. Um, current current satellites up on there uh, ha have some features that uh, on your phone, I can wipe it. Uh, if if you have 
access to your phone and set it up a specific way, I can wipe your phone all the data. So they're putting some of those measures into current satellites that are going up there because of uh, of that, because in 12 years, maybe that data uh, may not be respected to the threat actor, but it still could be because they showed how specific things run. So that's that's the best they can do. And it is it is a threat. You're absolutely correct, Brenda. Thanks. I was, it made me think about that. And there are some new questions that have been posted in the chat while we've been chatting. So let's go ahead and give those some attention. Okay. Um, AI, let's see. You can ask it to serve. Oh, he's talking about the AI. Um, fantastic. Could AI deep learn satellite communication and make it easier to uh, infiltrate satellites? Could AI deep? It depends on the networks. So the question for Steve, it depends on the networks. Um, so just to give you an idea, some of the networks that are out there and available are private, right? So our military ones, th those aren't going to be for human consumption, if you will. Um, some of the other networks, the deeper ones that uh, that are, are being developed right now by, by, I don't know, 25 different countries that are out there trying to make that, um, yeah, I, th I think because it's still at the beginning stages of that um, and AI understanding how the deep satellite network works could do it, but there's not a lot of data on the internet about that because it's such a newer technology. Um, so that that would be the best I could kind of answer that one. Thank you very much, uh, Rakan. Uh, anyone else? Okay, cool. And I think we're over time, right? 10? No, well, it? yeah, we have till about 10.15. Um, oh, so if okay. there's any additional questions that people have, please feel to, you know, jump in there um, and ask the question, or if you just want to post it to the chat. Um, I think there's one from Rob. Can AI be used to predict paths of debris and calculate the least risky path to intercepting and deorbiting the debris? I don't know if we answered that one or not. So, yeah, let's see. Oh, there's one new message you just made. <laughs> uh, let's see. I posted one that wasn't answered. All right, Remco, let me school up here. At Space Security Conference in Estonia last week said several times that cyber weakness is in the space infrastructure is not the space infrastructure, but at the ground segment. Does this project take into that consideration? Uh, yes. So to answer uh, your question about that, um, the ground station is the most vulnerable because of humans. Uh, and the human factor, and just to give you an example, during one of the space uh, exercises that we go through, uh, a um, fake courier comes up to the back door of a ground station, uh, brings in, um, says it's a package, it's not, they get themselves into a deep part of that uh, ground station and are able to drop off a USB onto the network and use what's called a RAT, a remote access Trojan to gain access. So um, I still think the weakness in the space infrastructure, it still is some of the space infrastructure because of going from analog to digital. When we did that shift, we weren't thinking of uh, secure by design. So I still think, I, I would argue a little bit against that, that the satellites now currently that are being designed, secured by design, they're getting better. And so when the code does go up up there, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get to, right? Um, just like I'm working on 5G on the moon. 5G is a private network that would just be on the moon. Mm -hmm. I can't hack that physical uh, 5G network unless I'm on the moon. Does that make sense? So um, however, if I connected to the internet and had a network, another network, then maybe I could pivot into it or laterally move. Mm -hmm. But in this one, um, I think that the ground segment is hugely vulnerable. Um, having um, a fence around your ground station is not enough. Um, it needs to be CIA level, if you ask me, specifically if it's critical infrastructure uh, type of satellites, they would need to be able to be protected. And so when you walk through... Uh, like the CIA or FBI, there are multiple areas that you have to get through uh, cement walls. You can't just walk in, right? You have a fence, maybe a guard there. That that that's that's a I don't know negative zero point of failure in my opinion because once I get past the fence, 
there's a guard, I go around, do something else, I'm in. And once you're in, uh, now you have cameras now, right? Well, I'm disabling those with lasers, by the way, maybe. Um, so there's other things. So I do think it's it, it's part. Um, I hope I, I answered that okay there, Remco. And sorry if I said your name wrong. Let's see. Any other questions from the folks that are here? We have a few minutes. Did you have another one, Brenda? I think we only got I, your part I, one. I will always have a million questions. Um, <laughs> that's just the way my brain works. Um, I think it's about one that you talked about the, there was a question with respects to having, uh, creating these resources to our underserved kids. Oh, um, okay. Cisco. So, you know, if I were, if I were someone that wanted to start a club, because mm -hmm. you just said, I just needed to have a warm body in the room and Cisco yeah. started stuff for yeah. free. So what, all, all, what the, all that stuff, doing? all that stuff I've created in here. Okay. Um, introduction, okay. I teach them, um, how to um, actually, there's a, a club document. I give them a presentation, intro to space. I teach them, this is what the course is gonna be about. Um, this is what the students will need to learn and you set them off. You just need to have someone in there and tell tell the students, hey, as a teacher, I'm I'm still learning with you. I don't know enough about this, but I wanna help you. As soon as you break that barrier down that the teacher is in there to support you and help you not to be the dictator, then it creates a huge win for the club and the young people. Right. They know they have someone that cares and wants to get them to the next level. So I show them inside there, um, you know, sample lessons, uh, different things that the teacher, all they have to do is say, okay, let's go through this together. And I don't know anything. As soon as the teacher admits they don't know enough about this, it brings down that level to the underserved kids to go, oh, cool. She's the same space that I am. Does that make sense? Space, not me, space. <laughs> okay, there's another message. Let's see. Um, much of, oh, sorry, Remco, if I missed that one. Much of the ground infrastructure runs on clouds like AWS with so many access points, even like the homework set up with the satellite opposite. Let's see. Much of the ground infrastructure. I have to scroll up, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Can, can you help me? You can just speak if you want, Remco. So it's um, much of like the ground infrastructure runs on on clouds. Yes, uh, cloud uh, AWS has as their cloud version of space. So many access points, even homeworking setup of the satellite operators. Um, yeah, maybe 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 I can add to that. Uh, sure. This way it might be easier. It was mentioned last week again at this conference um, that 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 provides. Um, a very vulnerable backdoor is these are are people using normal routers like in in their home like like me here that are very easy to to access and you can install software it was said that kind of um, um, tracks the activity of the satellite operator from home for several weeks um, install the the this 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 type of of software and then at some point uh, hack into the infrastructure through simply through the routers in, in, in the house of the satellite operators who are working from home nowadays through the cloud. Yes. Okay. To answer your question, yes. So to give you an, uh, an idea, space agencies out there need to be using a vi virtual private network. If they're not using a virtual private network or a VPN, they are vulnerable. So what happens is I completely agree with you. Someone from one of our space agencies or a private industry um, works from home uh, and they are not using that. I completely 100% agree that a man in the middle attack could happen on that router. What needs to happen also on the AWS ground station, they tell you, hey, make sure you're using VPN to connect to uh, your satellite down to the cloud or up to the cloud. I guess it's in the same zone, but literally it's still a server, if you will. It's still on the ground. So I always uh, preface that hacking at that level, that means... This is a very high level hack that, that you're speaking about. Um, and I don't know what they said at the conference, but that's something that's, that's um, this is going to be a 10 year, 12 year hacker. This is not going to be a, a script kitty, if you will, that could just follow some scripts and figure this out. So I always say, um, and, and just to let you know, when I'm teaching at Cal Poly or any parts, I always use my VPN. 
um, because my web browser could be vulnerable, right? And that browser means it's directly the correlation between talking to what I'm looking at and my, my Cal Poly portal, right? I'm using um, a virtual private network, or if you don't know what that is, it's literally a cable that goes from your house to Cal Poly and no one in the middle can touch it. It's very, very secure, 999.82% secure. So virtual private networks, I think um, that would be, and you're talking about the Russian Ukraine, yes. So at the highest level hacking, yes. Um, what advice would you give people in the room to expand um, on your work? I think we don't have enough people in this space. Um, just to give you an idea, um, to, to blow your mind, I, I have one more website to go to and show you, but cyberseek.org, and I'm just gonna zip over here to California because that's where I currently live. Um, the national level total cybersecurity job openings is 572,000, okay? That's nuts, right? The national level. That is just absolutely bros, blows my way, uh, mind. And California has a uh, certification. They're trying to get things uh, in, in a different space, if you will. And California currently has 55,367. So, um, uh, yes, you need to realize we need more people. And that's where I'm a huge advocate, uh, just as Mark is as well. And again, I hope that if anything, share this with a young person that is in your family, cousin, nephew, niece, someone that you know, share something with this. Show them the, show them the org chart that I showed you that has to do with the tracker as well as how many things are going. They're going to run our universe in the next 20 years. They need to at least have some kind of awareness about it. So that's what I would say. And thank you. So, so, uh, Minty asked you how to get in the cyberspace. We'll be showing in this. Oh, cool. Thanks, Joshi. It's right. a really great one. Uh, blows my mind every time how many jobs are available. And thank you so much, Mark. How many seconds? Uh, You're good. Yeah. I, I really appreciate all your help. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. It was a lot of really great information. Thank you for sharing your, th it's obvious your passion for this. And if there's a, a play, a, a way that people can get in touch with you for any follow-ups, if you want to uh, post that in the chat or somehow yep. later on that people can get in touch with you, that would be great. I will officially stop the recording at this point. The next session will start at, uh, the, at the half hour, wherever you're at. Um, in this room, it will be the importance of student and teacher efficacy in space education with Dr. Christina Otero. Again, thank you and everybody have a great time. Take a break, bio break, stand up, stretch, and we'll see you here in about 15 minutes. Thanks, Brenda.